Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So it depends on where you are. So we have different time, but yeah, it's um, you know it's it's an honor to host today's uh, conference for uh, tonight. And um, so it's the I can ask talk um, every Friday for the young scientists, and the goal is to connect the world and universe. So. I just to give a brief introduction of myself, I'm Yan Wei Jia. I'm currently an associate professor at University of Macau, affiliated with the, the uh, Institute of Microelectronics. And um, my research topic mainly focus on the digital microfluidics and its application in biomedical science for biology, precision medicine, et cetera. So I work on DNA, uh, detection, work on cell drug screening the, for those really uh, for precession medicine. So um, for, you know, we have uh, this conference every Friday and last Friday is um, from the Professor Tobata from Q2 University of Advanced Science. And tonight we have three speakers um, Professor Bavin Shastri from Queen's University, Professor Matthew uh, Lockett from University of North Carolina, and uh, Professor Jinjie Yao from Duke University. And yeah, and we also have Professor Alice Zhang from Peking University. He's the founder of Icon X Talks. And um, yeah, we, we, you know, the, the conference is actually at different time zones around the world. It's always Friday. So um, shall we start from Professor Lockheed first? Uh, I suggest we start from matter because we haven't did in the, you know, the double check slides yet. Okay, yeah. So uh, let me give some um, a brief introduction on uh, Professor Lockheed. So Professor Lockheed is um, an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and an associate member of the Lindbergh Comprehensive Cancer at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he got his PhD from University of Wisconsin and um, post trained at Harvard University. So tonight, Professor um, Lockheed will give us the topic on um, the importance of model systems in biology and material science, a measurement perspective. So I'll pass the screen to Professor Lockheed to give the talk. Okay, I stop share here. Yeah, I see Professor Shastri, yeah. All right, let's see. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff we've done or that we have been doing um, at, at UNC. Uh, and I'll just get started by talking about, you know, what do we do? So my lab is actually split in half. I, half of my lab works on um, solar fuel production or using materials to convert sunlight into um, high value carbon products, right? So thinking about converting carbon dioxide into ethanol or carbon dioxide into butanol or higher um, carbon value compounds. The other thing my lab does is we focus a lot on thinking about how do you make tissue biology uh, really accessible? And that's what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about you know, how we think about making systems that are really easy to use. And the, you know, we're kind of guided by two things in my lab or two philosophies. One is from my postdoc advisor, right? Which basically says that if you want to understand something that's really complex, the best thing to do is develop a model. And a model is going to be something where you have complete control over the system and the system has many, many parameters, right? And you're going to be able to turn the knob for each parameter to find out how that's going to affect the system. And we think about that a lot, you know, given that cells as reagents or cells as things that you're going to use for a potential readout, um, there's many, many inputs. 
some which you do and some which you don't even know you're doing, which is going to affect the output, right? And so these models will help us. And um, the other thing I think about a lot as a measurement scientist is that we're only ever going to be as good as the things we can measure. And so I've been trying to think about uh, as a researcher, you know, what are the best measurement tools we can come up with? But not in terms of the most sophisticated research tools, more in terms of research tools that everyone can use and that are going to be accessible as you think about measurement. And so from that, you know, we're just going to jump in. And so this isn't a biology talk. Um, there's not, you don't have to learn anything from this slide. Really, the point is to show you that biology, um, and in particular tissues, are beautiful, right? We are composed of cells, cells which interact with each other, cells that are different types, right? And so you can see in this, in this, in these two pictures, right? I show you a histology slide, right? Which is basically tissue that's taken from the body. It's fixed and then stained. And you can see in the top here that there is, um, where's my little later pointer? Um, you can see here, right, that there's, this is a milk duct, which is in breast tissue, right? So you can see that here's the region where the milk would be produced and stored, right? There are cells that surround that, around those cells, there's a really thick protein barrier and that protects those cells that are going to produce the milk from all of the other cells, right? Immune cells, which are going to take care of foreign things, fibroblasts, which are going to fix wounds and kind of make sure that the tissue is healthy. They're all there kind of working in harmony. Um, and, and down below is a picture of um, a slice of a human liver, right? Thinking about how our liver is divided into these tiny little hexagons and each of these hexagons are interacting with each other. And each hexagon has thousands of cells in them, which are taking the blood and detoxifying it. And so, you know, when you look at this, you think, oh, the body is really, really complex. And I have to think about as I'm developing new assays and measurements, how is it that I am going to be able to capture all of this complexity to predict how is a liver going to metabolize drugs? Right? How is it going to metabolize when you're taking multiple drugs and they might interact with each other? And the other thing is thinking about, you know, how are complicated systems producing things, maybe producing milk or hormones or something of that nature. And so my lab focuses on these two systems. We build and think about healthy livers and we think about how to study milk ducts. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, as we kind of move through. And so if you're thinking about developing technologies and you're thinking about how is it that I'm going to make predictions in the lab as to how a human is going to respond to things, right? We come to kind of the traditional workflow. Traditionally, we're going to be in the lab making predictions on in how cells behave to chemicals. We're then going to maybe translate that into an animal model and hopefully soon we'll put that into a human. And so this is kind of what we would consider the drug discovery pipeline, right? Where on the left, you have what's considered this in-lab kind of preclinical setting, screening lots of drugs to figure out which ones are going to be good to test in animals and potentially in humans. You know, once you identify a few of those compounds, you move them into the mouse. The mouse is going to act as that preclinical model that's going to be more complex than what we can do in the lab. Um, and hopefully that's going to translate into what's going to happen when we take that one particular drug and ask patients to try it to find out what's going on. And so, you know, if we could break down this picture a little bit more, you know, the traditional way that most people are doing in, in lab cell culture is that they're taking cells just like this picture, they're putting them on a plastic dish, they're giving them all the oxygen and all of the nutrients they would ever need. And they're going to predict what happens to those cells when you get them drugs. And, you know, this is really easy to do. It's easy to grow the cells. It's easy to maintain them. They're all on a single layer. So it's really easy to view them with your microscope. But I think you could see that there's a problem here in predicting complex systems. Normally, there's one cell type. Normally, all the cells are put on a piece of plastic, which in general is not what your tissues look like, right? There are not pieces of plastic inside you with cells growing on them. 
we're putting them in oxygen tensions, which match what the atmosphere looks like, right? And so when you think about that, the traditional tissue, right? If we were to take that, that breast tissue again and think about it, the partial pressure of oxygen in there is about 52 millimeters mercury of oxygen. In cell culture, we're, we're exposing cells, which are supposed to act just like human cells to about 180 uh, millimeters mercury of, of partial pressure oxygen, right? So we're giving them way more oxygen than they have ever seen. And we're going to expect that they're going to behave like they would in, 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 in mice or in humans. And that probably is not realistic. Um, and so that's one kind of current problem with the pipeline. So we're not making good predictions from the very beginning because we don't have systems that look like tissue. When we move into animal models, there also can be problems, right? Mice do not have exactly the same physiology that we do, but they are one of the gold standards in terms of assessing drugs. Part of the problem that, or one problem that can arise is that mice livers are very different than human livers. And so the rate at which they're gonna metabolize drugs, the enzymes that they're gonna to express to metabolize those drugs are pretty different than what's gonna go on in humans. And so you can get somewhat of a prediction, but maybe not the best. Another kind of flaw in the pipeline is that we now know, at least in the United States, that animal models are going to be phased out or significantly reduced in the years to come. So the Federal Drug Administration Modernization Act, which was renewed in 2022, has said that they now want fewer animals used in drug testing. And that means that we have to find alternatives to do that. The National Institute of Health has also come up right behind that and said, we agree, we want less animals used. We need more clinically relevant models. And so that for chemists and biologists and engineers is great, right? We now can think about how can we make tools which are gonna better represent humans to kind of eliminate steps one and steps two in this little picture I have. And the reason we wanna do this is that 90% of drugs that make it to clinical trials, 90% of drugs that humans are actually gonna try fail. That's like a pretty huge failure rate. And if you think about it in terms of how much money is spent on average in the lab with cells on a dish and in a mouse, it's close to $400 million, right? So that's $400 million over and over and over again, just to get to the beginning of clinical trials to have it fail. And so that's gonna, it's a huge cost prohibitive process, especially one that isn't gonna yield the results. And so with this thought of getting rid of animals, you know, the question is, what are we gonna do? And it turns out that there are tons of technologies that exist that are being developed that are going to be able to better predict how cells are going to behave in humans. They're going to use more tissue-like architectures. They're going to put cells in environments that are more like humans. And so when we test them, we're going to have a better idea or a better predictive power as to how they're going to behave. And so here's some pictures none which came from my lab and none of these are endorsements for companies. They're just kind of examples of things you can do, right? And there are these things that you can grow individual, you can take cells and have them grow into 3D architectures, kind of like this sphere right here, which is just basically a freestanding ball of cells. You can have different cell types there and you can put them all together and it kind of begins to develop a 3D network. And that 3D environment actually is more predictive of what goes on in human tissue than growing cells on dishes. And so that's one nice way that we really can think about making 3D environments for cells to behave in. This is probably the least engineering um, intensive, right? We're gonna take some cells, we're gonna put them in an environment where the cells favor each other. They're all gonna come together and grow. And if we wait long enough, we'll get these pretty big tissue aggregates that we can use. You know, for people who are more engineering savvy, think, thinking about lithography, whether it be photolithography or soft lithography, thinking about uh, 3D printing and how to grow devices or build devices, you know, you can do things where 
you can have these microfluidic devices, you know, one's up here and, and two down here, where we're going to be able to introduce flow. We're going to be able to introduce exactly the types of media that we want. We're going to be able to put the cells under the oxygen tensions we want. And this little cross um, picture here is going to show you, you know, you could grow cells again, maybe just as a monolayer, but now we're going to have that ability to say that in certain tissues, maybe the tops of the cells are going to be exposed to one type of media or one type of environment, and the bottom of the cells are going to be exposed to another. And that's going to be really important for maintaining their biological function, something that can't be done on these plastic dishes. And so this, to me, is like the future of where biology and chemistry and engineering are going in terms of predictive models. But I think one thing that you can appreciate from this is that there's a huge step between what's going on in the left and what's going on in the middle, right? Having cells and putting them on plastic dishes, putting them in an incubator and walking away is technologically very simple compared to making a device or buying a device, figuring out how to load the cells into that device, and then having all the tubes and wires you need to have everything get the fluid it needs and the nutrients it needs and, and to maintain the environment. And for labs that for the last 60 to 70 years have been growing cells like this on the left, these things in the middle are sci-fi and beautiful, but they're also a huge technology barrier. How is it that I, who've been doing cell culture the same way for 20 years, is going to adopt one of these things? And so this is kind of where we came in and we thought about, you know, are there technologies which kind of are the first step to getting you to these beautiful and new devices, which are sci-fi? And how can we make a technology which is going to be using what people are already doing? People are taking cells and liquids and pipetting them. They're putting them in a place they're incubating them and they're coming back. That's what they feel really comfortable with. And it's a really low tech solution. How do we do that and take traditional cell culture and move it into this end goal of something that looks like tissue? You know, and we like came up with our wish list of the things we would want. And so in a very Santa Claus kind of Christmas fashion, you know, we said, what are all the things that would move us towards the end goal that would be really helpful in prediction. And one of those is we wanted 3D environments, cells touching other cells, cells touching protein matrices, because that turns out to give those cells more in vivo-like processes. We wanted something that was gonna be really modular so that I could use it to make one type of tissue in my lab, but you could just as easily pick it up and make a completely different type of tissue in your lab. And you could, decide how many cells you wanted to use and what the composition was going to look like. And that was, we wanted something that was going to be pretty easy to pick up and be able to do just with pipetting. You know, we wanted to make sure that it could be physiological and we wanted to make sure that you could get spatially resolved data sets. And we'll kind of look at what that means, but basically we wanted to be able to say, if I put a bunch of cells in a 3D environment, can I look at different cells in different places and see what they're doing? And can I do it while the cells are still alive? Right? So that's kind of a tall order in terms of thinking about how you rethink about tissue models, but it's something you can do. And the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure it was materials that anybody could buy online, materials that anybody could assemble themselves. We wanted to really lower that engineering barrier. And the other thing, since we think about measurements a lot, is, again, for the last 60 years, if people have been putting cells on plastic with pipettes, we wanted to kind of maintain that technology. We also wanted to maintain the technologies they're already using. Is that microscope compatible? Can it be used with molecular biology techniques that are commonly used? Can we give them an alternative culture device where they don't have to buy a new expensive widget? where they don't have to buy a new expensive instrument that is only going to work with that format. We wanted to be able to take it and put it already into existing workflows. And so what does that look like? Well, you know, if we come back to this little cartoon I drew uh, on the earlier slide of a milk duct, right? You can see, all right, we have some pink cells surrounded by purple cells, surrounded by this blue little protein matrix. 
and some green cells on the outside. And if we were to take that milk duct and we were to take a pair of scissors and cut it and lay it out flat, the thing that I see is nothing more than a layer cake, right? And so we can think about human tissues basically as just layer upon layer of different cells interacting with each other. And if we kind of take this simplistic but and cartoon view of what a tissue is, we can start to say, okay, maybe there is a model system where I can build complex tissues just by thinking about this layer cake idea of taking different layers and putting them together. And then when I'm done being able to take them apart. And that's what we did. We said, okay, how is it that we can put cells into defined volumes? We can have those cells in each of those defined volumes put together like a layer cake, have them interact with each other, and then take the layer layers of the cake apart. And so we started with something that was already developed. Um, this was stuff that was developed in my postdoc lab. Uh, this idea that paper is, rel is um, accessible to everybody, right? We can go to Sigma Aldrich or your favorite place to order things now. You can buy Wattman 105 paper, which is a paper we use pretty often. And it's going to give you an environment that's going to be able to support cells, right? We know that paper has an X and a Y dimension because we write on it all the time. When you look under the microscope, so here's a bright field image looking through this Wattman 105 paper. It also has a Z, it has a Z dimension, right? So we know that it has a defined thickness. When we look in the microscope, we also see that there's a lot of pores. Those pores are going to be places where we can put the cells. And so now we have an individual place where we can put cells and maintain them. And the way that we do this in our lab is we take these, these sheets of paper, we use a wax printing method. So we use wax, which is hydrophobic, right? Paper is made of cellulose fibers, which is hydrophilic and really wicks in water. And what we do is we build these hydrophobic patterns, right? And so we can look at the zoom in image here, right? We have this black hydrophobic wax surrounded by individual regions of exposed cellulose fibers. That's going to make a defined volume in which I can put cells. And so we said that one of the things we really wanted was a technology that was going to use what people currently are doing, taking cells and liquids, sucking them up in their pipette, depositing them somewhere. And so you can kind of see that's exactly what we're doing. We're making these defined little regions we're gonna be able to take cells. We normally take cells suspended in a hydrogel, right? So hydrogels are um, gelatin-like materials. So they're gonna have the property of a gel, but they're about 90%, 80 to 90% water. So they're gonna be places where are permeable to water. They're gonna be places where proteins and nutrients are gonna be able to soak in and it's gonna keep the cells healthy. We can take those cells and suspend them in your favorite gel, right? It could be proteins that came from, from the body. It could be synthetic gels. It could be any gel you want. We suspend those cells. We put them in the environment. And you can see this little cross section here, right? If this is the cross section of a piece of paper, you know, we're taking a 40 micron thin slab of gelatin, putting cells in it, right? That's gonna be something that's super fragile. But by putting that in this scaffold, each of the cellulose fibers is going to act almost like the rebar that you put in when you pour concrete, right? It's going to be there to help keep the structure of that gel and the cell. So we're going to be able to pick it up and use it and do it however we want. You know, and here's a picture, here's a confocal micrograph of those cells growing inside the paper scaffold. So we have kind of some nuclei labeled with a blue fluorescent dye. The cells themselves are labeled with a green fluorescent dye. And the one thing you can see is in the background, you can see that there are some blue paper fibers there, right? The paper fibers are white because we bleach them. We bleach them with things that are going to have high background fluorescence. They're also going to be kind of opaque when we think about them in terms of light penetration, if you don't um, optically clear them. And so one drawback of the system is that while it's really easy to put together, sometimes microscopy is a little limited by those fibers, but we have found that the system works really well. And we found that, you know, just like our picture of the layer cake, we're able to take each of those individual sheets of paper with cells in them. 
And we can stack them on top of each other to make tissues as thick as we want, right? So layers one through four could be all the same cells. They could be all different cells. We're going to put them together. And we put them in a little holder that's going to squunch them all together so that all of the layers are in contact. It's going to be just like a tissue. Many different cell types in contact with one another. They're going to have the ability to communicate with one another. And they're going to be able to move back and forth. And at the end of the experiment, we're going to be able to take apart each of those layers, right? We can physically peel them apart. We don't need to fix the cells. We don't need to do anything to the cells other than peel them apart and analyze them. And so we're going to be able to say, you know, what did cells in the middle of the stack, how did they respond to whatever we did to them? We're going to be able to look at them while they're alive, and we're going to be able to keep growing them or keep culturing them if we want to look at them later on. And so the nice thing about this is, right, we came up with a material that is readily accessible. You can buy the paper. You can wax pattern it, or you could use other types of patterning methods, and you can make anything you want. We made things that look like 96 well plates, right? So we can grow 96 different cell cultures all at once. You know, you can make individual tiny little cell cultures, so a single sheet of paper that goes that you put the cells in and it goes right in a commercial 96 well plate. And you at least you don't have a stack structure, but at least you have one 3D environment in which cells can be maintained. And so we really like this because, you know, it's been a system that we've gotten to look at a lot of kind of tissue different interactions, some which I'm going to show you in a little bit. But we always came back to the one problem. And that was that when you did the microscopy, there always were these paper fibers that were kind of in the way. And if you wanted to be able to clear the fibers so that you could see the, all the cells in that 40 micron slab, it meant that you had to fix them. And it meant that then you had to do optical clearing, which meant that you're going to take some liquids that are going to index match against the fibers so that when we index match them, they're no longer opaque. And we're going to be able to see all those cells. The problem there is that it's it, one, it's not hard to do, and there isn't a problem in terms of imaging cells. One of the limitations, though, is that you have to fix them, right? So if you wanted to keep growing them, that's out. And so another way that we've come up with this is, again, we thought, okay, that's like a lot. You know, could we come up with something that's going to be more optically clear that also is going to be super easy? And what we came up with is kind of a cut and paste process. You know, we use a laser cutter to cut these apart, but you could do it with scissors or a hole punch. And so what we wanted to do was be able to have a region where we could put cells. They were going to be surrounded by a border so that it would keep the cells inside. And then it was going to have a defined thickness, again, like the paper. But here it was going to be an open well concept. So all the cell and the gels were going to go in there. They were going to form their little slab and they were going to be supported in a well structure. And what we did is we went online, we bought some materials which we knew were going to be cell compatible. We bought food grade silicone, which can be sterilized and is cell compatible. We took a laser cutter and we cut out a bunch of little holes. That was going to be this region here, right, where we were going to put our cells and our gel. We went to the hardware store and we bought as many spray adhesives as we could find. And we looked for one that was going to be cell compatible. Uh, we found uh, there's actually quite a few. So we were going to spray that material and put that adhesive on it. And then we were going to come around on, on the other, on the bottom side, and we were going to put a material which was going to be porous, but was the pores were going to be small enough that it would be able to support that gel. So we have a well structure with a bottom plate. Um, and then we went back through and we recut them out so that we had this region around the end. And we could put our cells in them and we could put them in the dish and we could go. We would be able to stack them again. We chose the materials kind of in another method, which was thinking about where the cells would be. And this PET silicone is actually quite nice because it makes them buoyant. So when you set the cells on the liquid, they stay right at that air liquid interface. So you can put them in a dish as you're making them. They're going to float around at the air liquid interface. You can pull them out as you need them to make that stack structure. Um, and so that's been really nice for us. And we tried a couple of different materials. You know, you can buy nylon meshes of all different sizes. So you could buy them with really small pore sizes so that the cells are all stuck inside the well and can never get out. 
You could buy a PET film, which is porous. They make all sorts of, um, there's commercial grade, optically clear PET films you can use, which are going to have pore sizes that again are going to allow the cells to move out. Um, but the difference between these two really is their optical clarity, right? And so you can see, here's a little bright field fluorescent image of the letter N that we printed. If you put a piece of nylon on top of it, you can still see the N, but you could see where maybe with microscopy that might be somewhat problematic because we're not getting maybe the best resolution. You know, you can, again, if you wanted to fix the cells like you did in the paper, you could go and optically clear them, right? So we could add some glycerol. We could optically clear the majority of the nylon. And the one thing you see is that you can see all the little air gaps between each of the mesh pieces, right? And so that's going to give you this, this kind of like gridded pattern that you see. But we can do microscopy pretty well there. You know, the porous PET films, you can just take them, set them right on the microscope and go. And you get the best optical clarity there. And so, you know, you can kind of choose your materials as you want, but we have something now where we're going to be able to image all the cells. And so you can kind of see that here, right? We have this um, projection confocal micrograph of some cells that we labeled with green and we put them inside that well, right? So they're going to have a defined thickness and a defined region. We can show that the cells are homogenous throughout and that they're maintained in that region. So we have a place where we can put the cells and they're going to be able to, based on this image here on the right, proliferate, right? So this is a confocal, a single plane confocal image of some cells inside one of these scaffolds um, where we went through and we looked at them, where we dyed each of the nuclei blue with um, this DAPI. So that blue fluorescence is each nuclei and the green colored nuclei were dyed for cells that were specifically proliferating, right? So we can have cells get in there and grow. And so we can get some really nice images of what the cells are doing. We can reconstruct them into 3D images and not have to worry about these paper scaffolds. And so now we have kind of two things. You, you know, if you choose to buy paper and wax pattern it or pattern it in some way, if you are able to buy materials and cut them out or use a laser cutter, you have two things that we're gonna be able to grow cells in in 3D environments. You can take any cell you want, you can take any matrix you want, you can put them in at any density you want and grow those cells. And so, you know, I want to take the simplest example. So we don't have to think about a lot of biology. And I want to come back to our little picture of this healthy milk duct, right? We have all of these pink epithelial cells. One common cancer in breast cancer is something that's called a carcinoma, cancer that comes from epithelial cells. Right? These are epithelial cells, which normally are contact inhibited. Once the milk duct gets full the whole way around, the cells stop. Because of environmental exposures or maybe a predisposition of can to cancer, something gets turned on in those cells where they're going to no longer be contact inhibited and they're going to grow and grow and grow until they fill the milk duct. Right? This kind of solid tumor that's going to be formed is called a ductal carcinoma in situ. There are lots of models that already exist, right? We saw pictures of them earlier on. We can make something that's gonna look like this ball of cells in, in vivo inside that milk duct just by taking cells in the lab, putting them in an environment where the cells favor attaching to each other as opposed to attaching to a material. And we can grow these different spheroid structures, right? And with time, we can let them grow to the diameter we want. The first kind of, major investigation of these spheroids was done in the late 70s. And since then, people have continued to grow these. And this is from a review article, which actually was quite old now, from 2010, but actually goes through and shows you that these spheroid models behave much like um, these carcinomas in, in the body. They're gonna be diffusion limited environments, mainly because as the cells are growing, they're growing out, cells on the outside are gonna get all the oxygen and nutrients they need. They're gonna be able to proliferate really highly. It, but if those cells on the outside consume oxygen faster than oxygen can diffuse through the tissue, it means that the cells on the inside aren't gonna get all the oxygen they need. They're not gonna get all the glucose they need they're gonna stop proliferating because they don't have the things that they want and they're gonna actually start to die, 
And so what we get are these diffusion limited environments that we can grow in the lab, which we're going to be able to, if we fix the cells and slice them and then look under the microscope, we're going to be able to see regions that are very similar to what goes on in the body. Regions of cells where you're going to have highly proliferative, some not so proliferative, but still alive, and a necrotic core where most of them are dead. And so we thought, okay, that's cool, right? You can do this as long as your cells are going to be able to make those environments, are going to be able to attach to one another. But there are some cancers that even though they form solid tumors in the body, it's actually pretty hard to get them to form solid structures in a dish or in the lab. And so we thought, okay, with our layer cake idea, we can do exactly the same thing. I can take individual scaffolds. I can pipette them so that they have cells and gels and I can stack them all together. And so I can make something that's gonna be a thick construct. And if I wanted it to look like this carcinoma here on the left, all I have to do is take one piece of material on the bottom of my stack, which is not gonna let any oxygen pass through, is not gonna let any liquid pass through, is not gonna let nutrients or waste products pass through. It's gonna be a really oxygen poor environment with a low pH, and it's gonna look exactly like the center of this tumor. On the top, I can put materials that are gonna allow the exchange, right? And I have something which is gonna act like the outside of the spheroid um, or the outside of the tumor. And I'm gonna be able to assemble this and take it apart. And so just to show you that this kind of works, you know, here's some older data that we've done, but the idea was we took the stack, we smushed it all together, and we watched it over time. So we would incubate it for 72 hours. We would take apart each of the layers and we would look at the numbers of cells, right? And so you can see here on the y-axis, closest to the nutrients, furthest away to the, from the source of nutrients, each of those scaffolds. On the x-axis, as the number goes up, it correlates to increased numbers of cells. And so we see that there's lots more alive cells at the top than there are at the bottom, but there's still some live cells there. And this graph over here just kind of is um, normalized so that I can show you what we did. So we took a bunch of these stacks and we exposed them to different concentrations of drugs. You can see as you add a drug, one that is an anti-neoplastic, which is going to go after dividing cells, you know, we can already see we're starting to kill some cells in this region. We can add some more drug, we kill some more cells. We can add some more drug, we kill some more cells. And so what we get is that we get these spatially resolved sets where we can say, as I put drug in, where are cells being the most affected by the drug and where are they not? And we can see down here at the bottom that there's a place where none of the cells are being uh, affected. And you could think to yourself, okay, that's because no drug got down there and that's possible. But the other thing is, is maybe it's just that the cells are different. And so this little experiment was we took our cell stack, we took a really easy to visualize fluorescent dye we stuck it on the top and we watched how long did it take to get to steady state where there was fluorescence dye at the bottom. Right? And you can see like 300 minutes, much shorter than the 72 hour dosing periods we were used. So we know that the cells at the bottom are being exposed to high concentrations of drug throughout the experiment. One other little quick thing we did is we went through and we stained all the cells to look for where were cells proliferating and where were they not. And this blue region is cells that are proliferating. So we had a drug that was gonna go after proliferating cells. It had the most effect where the cells were proliferating. So that's good. And we can see down here, these live cells weren't affected because they weren't, right? And so now we have a test bed where we really can say, how are drugs gonna behave when they hit different regions? One of the Professor other things Lockett? we can- Yeah. Professor Luck. Yeah, um, please, uh, there will be a time limit. So can you close it in like two minutes? Yeah, totally. So we can look at this okay. and say that there's an oxygen limitation that's going on there. And we can measure those oxygen limitations and say, we can measure each of the layers and say, what is the oxygen tension? Are the cells, in real time, we can do that. We can say, are the cells proliferating? And then based on that, we can go through and back out what's going on in the environment. We can do this with some sensors that we've developed. We can do it with in-cell sensors. The other thing we can do is we can look with mass spec and say, where are the cells metabolizing drug? Are those cells at the bottom that aren't dying? 
are they metabolizing? And we can do this with mass spectrometry, taking apart the layers and measuring and quantifying how much parent drug is there and how much of the metabolized drug. And all I wanted to show with this last little piece is that we can actually show that those cells that aren't dying are metabolizing the drug. So we know that the drug's getting there. We know it's being metabolized. Now we're on the mission to figure out why exactly those cells are not responding. And with that, you know, I'll kind of just end and say, what we have is this platform where we can really easily make tissue structures and tumor structures. We can dose them. We can think about how the cells are responding. And with this, we have basically started to make the gap between putting cells in dishes and cell and thinking about how cells behave in people. And we can make all sorts of structures to do that. And with that, I'm actually done and I'll turn it off to somebody else. But just thanks. Um, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to shoot me emails. I'm happy to talk about the stuff we do. Yeah, great. Thanks to Professor Lucky. That's a wonderful talk. So to save time, um, okay. To, to save time, we'll leave all the questions after the talks and to have discussion, all right? So we'll go to the uh, next speaker. Um, I think uh, we'll introduce Professor Bavin Shastri from Queen's University. So Professor Shastri is currently an assistant professor of engineering physics at Queen's University and also a faculty affiliate at Vector Institute. He received his PhD from McGill University and um, was trained as a postdoc at Princeton University. So tonight, um, Professor Shastri will give the talk on neuromorphic, a neuromorphic photonic computing, classical to quantum. Now, um, Professor Shastri, can you share your slide? Uh, yes, uh, well, hopefully you can hear me okay. And yeah, um, I can see and hopefully you can see my slides. Yes, both. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, well, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I'm excited to present uh, some of the work that my lab has been doing over the past uh, five years. And before that, uh, when I was a postdoc at Princeton in Paul Prusnell's lab, I'll be talking about how um, we are interested in doing computing with light. Um, and specifically, we're interested in making neural networks uh, with light um, on this platforms that are called silicon photonics. So these are platforms that allow you to integrate uh, optical devices on a, uh, on on a very small on a very um, small scale, and you can build large scale integrated circuits as shown on the on this photo on this slide here. And the idea is to see whether we can enable new applications in artificial intelligence and neuromorphic computing. Um, I would like to start acknowledging my my collaborators and 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 my postdoc advisor in whose work in whose lab I started a lot of this work, um, and um, and other collaborators have contributed to this work along the way, and of course the fabrication support that we receive for the chips that I'll be showing uh, today. Um, I wouldn't be here without my students and postdocs. They are really the ones who are doing all the all the work and coming up with all this um, original ideas. And I'm just uh, humbled to get this opportunity uh, to represent them and uh, and present their work on their behalf. Uh, so here's an outline of my talk. I would like to briefly introduce what we mean by neuromorphic uh, photonics, uh, why it is important, um, and why we're interested in it. I will then talk about how we're building this uh, neural networks uh, using uh, photonic hardware. And then I'll talk about a few applications that we've demonstrated um, and then provide a roadmap for this uh, for this field. So we know artificial in intelligence is all around us from natural language processing to large language models to you know computers playing games like go and and beating human world champions. And also, in a lot of cases, uh, machines have really uh, approached but also exceeded human level accuracy in tasks that humans are good at. And this is really enabled by, by what's called deep learning or by neural networks that are really deep in, uh, in, in nature. And here's a quick primer. So 
the idea is to model networks or distributed processing that happens in our brains using some type of artificial models and hence the name artificial neural networks. These orange dots that you see here are circles. These are, um, uh, this are so-called neurons and I'll explain how how they work. Um, and the idea is that you can have this layers of neurons that can be interconnected by this lines, which are called mate, uh, which are called um, uh, synaptic weights that can be represented as matrices. So the idea is that uh, the way information gets processed in this type of systems, you input the data as some type of vector, it gets multiplied by a matrix that is this interconnections between these two sets of neurons, and you get another new vector that goes to the next layer and you keep repeating this process over and over and again. This matrix is quite uh, interesting. When people talk about training a neural network, they're really training this matrix, and it's trained to do specific tasks. For example, if I was giving it an image, maybe the first layer would be uh, trained to identify edges in an image. The next layer could be used to identify a combination of edges. Uh, this could be used to identify certain features. And as you keep going deeper and deeper into these networks, you're extracting uh, more and more details uh, of um, more and more features of, of a given image. And in the end, you can make a probabilistic estimation as to you know, what that image could be. For example, if you're trying to classify a human image from, from, uh, from animal images, maybe this, uh, maybe this uh, neural network will tell you with a, with a very high probability that that is a human face, for example. Um, now, the training of this type of AI systems takes a huge amount of computational resources. So this is a graph um, um, that shows on the y-axis the computational power required to train the AI systems. Um, this is shown on a log scale. And on the x-axis is the years. And this different data points here, these are different types of computers uh, that have been available. And what we see is that roughly around up to 2012, these computers were increasing uh, in their in their performance with uh, Moore's law like uh, scaling. Essentially, the number of transistors was doubling every every twenty four months, and that was keeping in line with the compute power required to train the AI systems. But what we see over the last uh, couple of years, actually, is that the compute power required to train the AI is doubling every two months. You know, this is with the emergence of uh, large language models like GPT and others. And even if Moore's law were to continue, we know it's slowing down, but even if Moore's law were to continue, you can see that the, the, the power required, the computational power required to train AI systems is far outpacing than what the computing hardware can provide today. And this is for this reason, we need thousands and thousands of CPUs and hundreds of GPUs just working in unison to provide that computational power. This, of course, means that you are uh, spending a lot of uh, money training this uh, type of uh, systems. Um, and very importantly, you're generating a lot of heat. Uh, so you need to cool down the systems. And to cool them down, you gen you know, that means that you're putting a lot of uh, carbon footprint into the atmosphere. And so training AI systems can, can be a huge uh, burden on the environment. Now, so therefore, there's a move towards not trying to trying to implement neural networks or AI algorithms not on standard digital hardware platforms the way it's done today, for, for example, on our on our computers, and it's enabled a number of applications as I mentioned, but it's limited in terms of speed. The idea is to move these neural networks and model, model them in hardware. Um, and this uh, is what we call neuron isomorphic engineering or neuro, neuromorphic engineering. This is not new. There's been a lot of work done in this area, some a lot of pioneering work done by Misha Mahavald uh, when she was at Caltech. And the idea is to be able to emulate the physics of the, of the, of the neurophysiology of neurons with, um, uh, with, the, with the physics of the underlying substrate. In this case, it could be, say, silicon. And the idea is to be able to do this processing in real time, uh, consume as little energy as possible, and fabricate as many hardware neurons as possible on a given chip. Now, there's been lots of work done in analog electronics to, to implement, uh, or even digital electronics to implement this type of neural networks and hardware. Um, work done by HP, Intel, IBM, uh, they're doing fantastic work. Uh, the challenge is interconnects, right? So when you start to build this large scale neural networks, each neuron needs to be connected to many neurons. And how do you physically do that? Well, you need to 
you, you need to bring in wires together. And if you start bringing many wires together, you'll have capacitance between them, in electromagnetic interference and, and also their topological constraints. So the fundamental limit in electronics is that you can't really have very complex systems and be fast at the same time. You need to trade off. And so for this reason, uh, the applications are sort of limited to a few kilohertz to a few megahertz time scales. Now, with neuromorphic photonics, what we're trying to do is trying to, uh, trying to basically uh, implement neural networks in hardware using the physics of light, using the um, using nanophotonic structures. And the idea is that by using by having this very low latency that's available to photonic interconnects uh, and the very huge bandwidth, we can potentially enable new applications that would be challenging for electronics. So these applications are, for example, in uh, nonlinear programming. For example, you want to solve an optimization problem. You have an object that's moving really fast and you want to intercept it. This boils down to solving an optimization problem. Um, and photonic integrated circuits have been shown that you can get this very, very low latency, picosecond latency, uh, to solve this type of optimization problems. It's also used in solving combinatorial optimization problems, right, which are like really, really hard uh, problems to, to solve. There's been lots of work on in trying to um, solve differential equations or partial differential equations using uh, analog uh, neural networks. Um, you can also speed up vector matrix of multiplications. Uh, essentially, this can be done in principle, all passively, and uh, and with zero energy. As the light is just propagating through the medium, uh, it is getting multiplied by some matrix as it comes out on the other side. And so this can be done purely by geometry of, uh, of the devices. Uh, there's been lots of work on what's called um, in compensating for non-linearities on fiber transmission systems. And this is what uh, we have worked on. In, uh, so these are signals that are already in the optical domain. You need to do some type of intelligent signal processing on them. Um, your, your signals go over thousands and thousands of kilometers of fiber. They accumulate non-linearities. You need to correct for those. Um, and so you can do this with, with, with this optical neural networks. I'll talk a bit about in my talk about how we can also do uh, processing of radio signals. These are wide band analog signals, uh, which uh, need to be processed in the analog domain directly without going to the digital domain. Um, um, and so we can also do this with optical uh, neural networks. And there's been lots of other applications in trying to implement so-called quantum neural networks that I'll talk about. And also in high energy physics, where you want to do particle classification and detection, you need very fast uh, um, uh, neural networks to do so. Now, there's been lots of work that has been that's been happening in, uh, in the implementation of this neural networks with photonics over the past 10 years. Um, there's been different types of platforms. So people have worked on so or something called reservoir computing that you might have uh, heard of. Um, people are implementing neural networks with multiple wavelengths of light uh, that I'll talk about. Um, they using other types of approaches, what are coherent networks are using a single wavelength of light to implement this networks in a passive way. Um, there are some people implementing um, um, uh, optical uh, neural networks using uh, spiking dynamics. So this is more closely related to the biology of, uh, of, uh, of neurons. Um, there's been lots of work on using diffractive or free space optics to implement neural networks, and also people implementing neural networks in in um, at low temperature using superconducting optoelectronics, essentially working as coprocessors with other type of um, you know uh, potentially quantum uh, technologies. This list is not exhaustive, but I the reason I wanted to show this slide is to show that there. Are, various uh, flavors of implementation of this photonic neural networks um, from integrated to free space, from room temperature to, to low temperature, genetic temperatures, from different types of computing models, from reservoir to spiking to artificial neural networks. So it's a very, it's a very um, uh, interesting field uh, to be in. Um, so at Princeton and in my lab, we have been working on this for the past 10 years. Of course, this field stretches way beyond that, but this kind of just gives you a timeline. Um, our, the, the, the progress that we have made over the past, um, um, uh, over the past decade, uh, in, uh, in, at Princeton and Queens, going all the way from the implementation of the spiking neurons, um, of a single neuron on uh, using this large discrete uh, components on a, on a given optical table, sort of like five by eight feet optical table, 
to now that we have fully packaged electronics and photonics on the same platform. And now we can use this for, for some very interesting applications that I will be talking about. Um, so, um, so how are we implementing this optical neural networks? So if I blow up one of these neurons that I showed up um, uh, uh, in the beginning, these neurons are doing something really, uh, they're doing something uh, very, um, something very simple. They have a linear front end where they're waiting uh, signals coming from other neurons and, and all those signals are then summed up together. And then you compare it with some type of threshold uh, and you do some decision making, and that's what's the the back end. So the way we implement this with with optics is that uh, we have this uh, freedom of using multiple wavelengths of light, uh, multiple frequencies or multiple colors of light that don't interact with one another. That's the fundamental nature of photons. So what you can do is encode information on this multiple frequencies of light, and you can multiplex it on a single waveguide. They're not going to interact with one another. Then what we do is that we use tunable filters. Now, um, without going into too much, too much details, these are tunable filters that can be tuned to a specific wavelength of light. So the analogy I like to use is that if uh, you know those when you have those AM or FM radios, you can tune the you can you can turn the tuning knob on the radio and tune to specific frequencies, RF frequencies. This is exactly the same. You can have nanophotonic structures that can be tuned to specific wavelengths of light, uh, they can be on resonance with certain frequencies of light. And you can tune them sl to be slightly on or off resonance, and they can light out light, uh, um, they can let out some amount of light from those from those devices. What we have implemented our tunable filters with is something called ring resonators. So these are tiny uh, optical waveguides that trap light in them when there's resonance, and then you can tune them slightly on and off resonance by changing the refractive index and you can let out a certain amount of light out. Now, when you do that, you can essentially weight every single wavelength of light independently and in parallel. Um, so essentially, you're multiplying this vector x with this weight uh, uh, vector w all passively. Uh, it's happening at the speed at which this light is propagating through this uh, medium. And then you use photo detectors to sum up all these different wavelengths. And this is what allows you then to get this dot product of the two vectors. You then can convert this. Uh, so now you get an electric current. And then you can you can modulate this on, an, on a different optical carrier using what's called a modulator. And, and this has a nonlinear activation function that can we, we can use for doing this decision making uh, or essentially implementing this nonlinearity. So we have implemented this uh, in my lab, uh, and, and several others have used uh, you know um, complementary techniques to do so. Uh, these are micro ring resonators uh, with with silicon waveguides on a silicon photonics platform, and you can see here we're putting a vector here. It's encoded in multiple uh, frequencies of light, and each of them is uh, is tuned to a specific weight. Uh, sorry, it's tuned to a specific wavelength and detuned slightly to essentially weight that light. We have here these photo detectors that sum up all these wavelengths, and what we're showing here is that you can get any values between one and minus one. Uh, so you can get both positive and negative weighting. And we can do this vector matrix multiplications. In this case, it is a one by four vector. And we can get this with precisions of around 6.7 bits as shown here. Now, this was using all multiple wavelengths of light. And we were limited by the number of wavelengths of light that you can have. And also, this weights need to be static. So these are thermally controlled. So just very recently, in fact, just a, couple, a few days ago, uh, we we put up a paper on archive where we show um, that we can actually extend this, um, implement a whole layer of neural networks using this time, uh, using what's called time multiplex approach, um, inspired by works of others, where you use this, what are called Max Zender modulators. So these are where you essentially input um, different data points of your two vectors and you're feeding them into these Max Zender modulators and they're getting multiplied before you do this balance detection. And then we're using this time integrator to sum up all this wavelengths, to sum up all these different components together. The interesting thing about this is that you can operate at really high speeds, which I'll talk about in just a second, 
but uh, this is enabled by thin film uh, lithium niobate uh, photonics. Uh, the imp other important thing is that this weights here are not stationary. You can change them at the speed at which you're processing information. Um, we have shown that you process information at 65 giga ops per second, uh, but you that was just limited by the test and measurement equipment, but you can go way beyond 100 or even 200 giga ops per second. Um, you can dynamically change in the, the number of uh, the, the fan in and fan out of your layers. So you can have different inputs and different outputs. So this is not a static system, it's purely dynamic. And this is all enabled by hybrid integration of this thin film lithium nibate modulators, lasers, and detectors. This work is done in collaboration with Krostowski's group and Shinlun Kai's group at Sun Yat-sen University. So this is uh, some uh, photographs of the chip and the integration platform. So you can see here we have these lasers that are integrated using photonic wire bonds uh, with our thin film lithium nibate uh, chip. We have... Um, this indium phosphide photodetectors wire bonded also to the same uh, to the same platform, and then we have all this uh, the PCB here with the uh, with the integrators and uh, the the and the digital to analog converters, and this shows the speed at which it goes to another, um, and the um, and the characteristics of this uh, photo uh, photo detector. So this is the experimental platform here, um, where we have these two thin film lithium niobate modulators. Uh, we input data using this um, digital to analog converters, and this is really what's limiting the speed right now, but they work up to 65 giga ops per second. And here we're essentially doing vector um, dot, vector dot products uh, with dimensions of more than 100,000 um, at, uh, at that computational speed and getting um, precisions of around 6.6 .6 bits. So to implement the nonlinear part, I talked about the, the, the linear part, and the nonlinear part is implemented using this uh, modulated nonlinearity. So what we do is we take a piece of silicon and um, we dope it with different P-type and N-type material, and that creates a depletion region. And now you can modulate the width of this depletion region. It's essentially like a, like a diode uh, that, uh, that you might have studied. Um, the interesting thing here is that by modulating this depletion region, um, uh, you uh, you can change the number of charge carriers that are present in this uh, in this device, and by changing the number of charge carriers to the first excuse me to the first order, uh, you can uh, affect the you can affect the refractive index of the material using what's called free carrier dispersion, or you can affect the uh, the the um, the amount of absorption or attenuation in the system using uh, free carrier uh, absorption. Um, and this is described by, by what's called the SORF equations. So we fabricated such a device. And what we do is that by biasing this modulators at different operating points, we can generate different types of transfer functions. And this is all reconfigurable. So this can be a programmable using a single device. And you can generate different types of transfer functions that can be used in different types of, um, uh, in, in different types of uh, neural networks. So this is now everything being integrated monolithically on the same platform. This is all fabricated using standard silicon photonic uh, foundries. So we don't do any fabrication in the in our clean rooms. We just do post-processing. It just goes to a standard silicon photonics foundry. It gets fabricated there and we can get uh, uh, we can get reasonably uh, high speeds in tens of gigahertz and also um, uh, efficiencies of around 500 femtojoules for doing a multiply accumulate, which is essentially a dot product of vectors. And but you can also go down to really low energies, as been demonstrated by um, uh, uh, by others. Uh, uh, this is work done. This is some work. This low energy work was done at NTT in Japan. So what we do in my lab is that we gen uh, we we fabricate this large. We design this large scale uh, photonic integrated circuits. We send them off to foundries, they ship them back to us, and then we do the packaging in our lab. Uh, this is what some of the packaging uh, might look like. Uh, this is done with uh, with, uh, with with our collaborators, um, where we have this, this printed circuit boards with, uh, with digital to analog converters, the current sources, everything integrated. We have RF inputs here, RF outputs, with all the photonic wire bonding done. And then we... 
those ring resonators and the photodetectors and modulators that I showed earlier, those need to be programmed. So we use standard machine learning libraries like TensorFlow, for example, to, to train on a particular task. And then we upload those weights as currents and voltages to this to this PCB, essentially to this chip, and then use it for different applications. So one of the applications that we have really looked into is, is in cognitive radio. This is called blind source separation. A very easy way to think about this is, is imagine two people are talking in a room uh, where there's a lot of uh, music and others uh, and a lot of noise uh, in the background. The two people can still understand one another or can isolate the signals um, uh, even if even in the presence of all that noise. And, um, and you cannot just use a filter to filter out that particular frequency because everyone is speaking pretty much at the same uh, frequency. So you need to rely on the statistics of the data. So one way that you can do this is using what's called blind source separation. The idea is that if your two signals are independent, right, then if they get mixed over this environment, then the received probability distribution function essentially will be Gaussian in nature. So by central limit theorem, if you have independent sources, you keep adding up the independent sources, you'll get a Gaussian distribution. So the idea is to take that Gaussian distribution that you get and make it as un-Gaussian as possible. So if I make this un-Gaussian as possible, then I can extract the independent components. Well, how do I make the signal un-Gaussian as possible? Uh, well, there's a measure, there's some, there's a measure in statistics called kurtosis. It's the fourth order mean or the fourth order, uh, fourth order standard deviation. And if I try to maximize that of the received samples, I can make the I can make the received distribution as non-Gaussian. And from there, I can try to extract my independent components. And so this can have a whole bunch of applications. Now, the reason why this is challenging for electronics, you can do this with electronics, but the, ch the challenge is that it has limited bandwidth. So if I'm going through a very large bandwidth of zero to say 20 hertz, for example, you know, with other applications and even and even beyond 5G and 6G, you have very narrow band to, to play with with electronics. Now, with each band, you need multiple antennas. These are MIMO systems, which are called multiple input, multiple output. Each of them needs to be converted from analog to digital. And then you do the digital signal processing. So you can see that this becomes a very complex system because the ADCs here, they can be quite power hungry. You're talking about N times M uh, number of uh, uh, ADCs because M such channels and N such uh, um, antennas per, per channel. And they also scale with the frequency. So the higher and higher frequency go, the more and more power penalty you're paying. So what we proposed is using a single photonic chip, a single photonic device that can that can cover the entire spectrum, uh, the entire radio spectrum, and we can do all the processing the, in the analog domain and just use a single ADC at the end to then do the uh, to do whatever DSP that needs to be done. And this power scales much more uh, favorably than than the quadratic scaling that you see with electronics. So here's a very simple system. We demonstrated this. Um, we got uh, two, uh, we essentially got uh, two signals coming on two antennas. Um, we weight them. This is using our ring resonators that I talked about before. So we weight each one of them. Uh, it goes through this uh, photo detectors. It goes through uh, uh, through um, uh, through an electronic uh, chip. This could be an FPG or a computer. And then we keep maximizing the kurtosis, essentially uh, updating these weights such that it will weight the signals uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, this whole uh, thing is integrated on the same platform. Um, this whole chip is integrated on the same uh, platform with the with the PCBs. Uh, sorry, integrated on the PCBs with all the electronics <laughs> and um, and these are the experimental results. These are so two antennas connected, um, you know, uh, in this in this uh, receiver system, a two by two system, going to our going to a chip. And these are the experimental results. So those are the original sources. This can be mixed in whatever fashion that you want. They have to be linear mixing, and then you can extract the independent components. We can do this over the entire twenty gigahertz uh, spectrum while still achieving a signal to interference uh, ratio of more than a third, thirty dB across the entire spectrum. Um, okay. Um, so um, 
this was a static antennas, but of course you can do this with dynamical moving sources as well. So very recently, this paper is uh, is uh, is forthcoming. It's uh, it's in press right now. Um, but the idea is that we could also do this with moving antennas, and uh, you know, as um, 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 with um, with and do this dynamical uh, blind source uh, separation. And we can essentially do this in real time. So we have now made a system that is even more um, that is even more complex to show the scalability. And we have shown that you can actually do this real time processing as well. So if you want to check out more details, they are available in this archive papers. But they are uh, they have been they are currently in, in press. So in the last three minutes, in the last two minutes, I will just talk about uh, one last application is in uh, quantum information processing, where we're using uh, where we're implementing so-called quantum uh, neural networks. So what you can do with uh, with linear optics is that you can implement any type of quantum algorithms, any type of quantum gates, uh, and you can do this with purely with linear optics. The the the, the the caveat is that it's fully probabilistic. So if you wanted to implement something called a Bell state analyzer, we don't need to know exactly what it is right now. Happy to explain later. But in the interest of time, say it was a some something called a Bell state analyzer, where you are, where you are um, um, projecting maximally entangled states to some type of a computational basis. That can be done only with fifty percent probability, with even with the best uh, theoretically uh, um, perfectly, um, you know. Uh -huh. Um, linear linear circuit with no noise. Now, if you try to create a communication network with using this Bell state analyzers to create a you know communication link between between two parties here, and you need multiple of these Bell state analyzers to create this uh, entanglement between um, between this uh, multiple um, points, you can see that if you're starting with the fifty percent probability, your probability of uh, of successful communication is going to drop. And so the idea is that can we implement some type of non-linearities in between this linear network and get near deterministic performance? And theoretically, yes, you can. And what we wanted to study is how, uh, you know, how you can do this with uh, with imperfect optics. So in the last minute, I'll just finish up now. Uh, what we do here is that we have created this meshes of mags uh, of this of this uh, linear optical components where the the photons can interact uh, with with one another. And um, and we create this type of single site nonlinearity. So essentially, it imparts a phase shift if there are two photons, but no phase shift is just a single photon. And this is happening at the single photon level. And you have this linear part here, the nonlinear part. And so this essentially is a, is a neural network implemented at a single photon uh, level. Uh, we can train this network. And what we can show is that even with weak nonlinearities, you can get very high um, fidelities in your system, which before was thought that you needed perfect nonlinearities. And what we show is that you don't need perfect nonlinearities. You can get weak. Non you can also use weak nonlinearities because you can tra you're training this as a neural network, and you can increase the number of layers in the neural network <laughs> uh, even when you have weak and weak nonlinearities and still get near deterministic performance. Okay. So to conclude, uh, I would say that um, this field is really progressing at a, at a fast pace. Um, we wrote a paper a couple of years ago, if you're interested in this review article, uh, where uh, we showed what are the other technologies that would be required to, to scale the systems up. This includes like integrating lasers, modulators, uh, data converters, uh, frequency comb sources, uh, electronics, and, and photonics. So on that note, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions uh, later on or now. Um, uh, and, and thank you again for, for listening to me. <laughs> and thank you, Professor Shastri, for the wonderful introduction of the brilliant work. We'll keep the questions all after the talks, OK? So then we'll move to the next speaker, uh, Professor Jing Jie Yao from Duke University. So Professor Jin Jie Yao is an Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Duke University. Also with a secondary appointment at Duke Neurology. He got his um, bachelor degree and master degree both from Tsinghua University in China and his PhD in Biomedical Engineering from Washington University. So today, um, Professor Yao will give us the introduction on 
the breaking limits in photoacoustic imaging, deeper, faster, and more colorful. Now, welcome, Professor Yao. Hey, thank you, Yan, um, Yan Wei, for introduction. Uh, yes. You guys can hear me, right? Okay, sounds good. Yes. So I should go ahead. Um, uh, my name is Junji Yao. Um, I work at Duke. Actually, I'm just 20 minutes away from Matt. Um, hopefully, I can catch up, Matt. Um, so my work at Duke is about photocosmetron, and we are doing more and more uh, research on the ultrasound set. I will say, um, you will say some of the work later. Uh, this is my lab. Uh, we have about uh, 15 to 20 people right now, and uh, we are uh, working with people from all different. Uh, uh, here. I'm sorry. Uh, we yeah. can see your nose. Yeah. So oh, we can I see. see your nose and exercise. So. So let me just swap it. Uh, is that uh, better now? Uh, no, no change. Yeah. No yes, change. I see. Yeah, I see change. So you see, see my presenter's see. mode, right? Uh, let me yes. see. Now it's how, okay, Jinjie. How about now? Yeah. yeah. Now okay. it's not okay, but not, not okay. okay for me. No. Not uh, okay no. for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably you have two uh, screens and just the show one to someone. I see, but now um, I, yeah, now I can see your notes. <laughs> just use my notes, All right? Let me see what I can do. I'll redo it. I stop sharing. I will reshare yeah, this. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, let me see which one I should share. Share the screen. That looks for good for me. How about Professor Zhang? Uh, um, back at the end. Now, now I see the notes. Yeah, yeah the previous. Them. Yeah, the previous. Uh, I'll try to swap it back. How about now? Okay, now it's good for me. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. You sure? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, I'll see where I am. Okay. Let's see, um, <clears throat> All right, so this is my lab. We have about 20 people in my lab and uh, we're working with people from all different uh, um, topics. You can see a lot of collaborators and uh, we are funded by NIH mostly, but we also have funding from other uh, you know, agencies to do uh, some fundamental work and also uh, clinical translation work. Uh, for people who are you know, working with light, um, you know, I know both Matt and, uh, and uh, by then, they, you probably have uh, experience with uh, photons. And if you do fluorescence imaging, like Matt has been working on the confocal, and you know that the, the process is pretty um, straightforward as from light to light. So you got one light in, you got one light out, or you got uh, two photon absorption, you got one photon out. So it's basic from photon to photon conversion. So for what I'm, what I'm doing, uh, photocosmogen, it's uh, roughly 50% uh, the same. So it's, um, um, you know, you got a photon in, um, photons are absorbed by the molecules. It elevates the electron from the ground state to the excited state. Uh, but when the excited uh, electron goes back to the ground state, it does not emit a fluorescent photon. Uh, what happens is the uh, energy is actually converted into heat, which is the thermal effect. And then the thermal, <clears throat> thermal effect increases local temperature that introduces uh, uh, kind of thermoelastic effect. Basically, that can change the local uh, pressure. And when the pressure propagates as acoustic wave, that can be converted or can be detected as ultrasound signals. And you can see that the photoacoustic effect, 50% 50 50 of the photoacoustic effect is actually the same as fluorescent um, emission. However, the second 50% is, um, is different. That is why uh, <clears throat> we are uh, actually fundamentally different from the traditional photocosmogen, I'm sorry, traditional fluorescence imaging, because we are detecting the ultrasound signals eventually. So why has to go through this uh, trouble 
to convert the photon to uh, sound wave. Uh, the reason is because sound waves are much better in terms of penetration. Uh, we'll say that that's, that's, uh, that's true for both imaging and for therapy and for treatment purpose. And what we really do in photocosm imaging is we actually can uh, put uh, a uh, very short laser pulse into the tissue. And when the photons are absorbed by the biomolecules, that local temperature is elevated and also the pressure is generated. And we can detect the pressure wave as ultrasound signal outside the tissue, just like uh, what you do with ultrasound imaging. And uh, we actually use the exact same ultrasound detection system, just like a traditional ultrasound imaging. So the whole process of photoacoustic imaging is, uh, has two parts. The first part is to use light to excite the molecules to generate this ultrasound pressure. So the, the beginning of the story is optical absorption. If there's no optical absorption, there's no uh, photoacoustic effects, there's no ultrasound signal then eventually there's no, uh, no contrast. So we think photoacoustic imaging is optical imaging eventually because of the optical absorption contrast. And that gives us a lot of benefit of, for example, functional and molecular imaging capabilities, just like traditional optical imaging. The second half of this imaging process is the ultrasound detection and eventually ultrasound imaging reconstruction. Because of the ultrasound waves can uh, propagate through the tissue much better than light without uh, scattering or distortion, then we can use the ultrasound signal to pinpoint where the light is absorbed or where does this photoacoustic effect happens. So eventually the resolution is determined by the ultrasound waves or ultrasound imaging reconstruction. That gives us almost the same resolution as traditional ultrasound imaging, but with the optical contrast eventually. So that really combines both the optical contrast of the optical imaging and the ultrasound penetration and resolution of the ultrasound imaging. So it's really a, a combination of both imaging modalities with their uh, best um, uh, merits. And uh, the, uh, if you put a photocoost imaging into the context of the other optic imaging modalities like a confocal two photon microscopy, you'll see that photocoost imaging is more flexible in terms of its resolution and penetration depths. So by uh, playing with both light and sound, uh, we can configure the optical, uh, you know, optical system and also configure the ultrasound system in order to achieve different penetration depths with the corresponding resolutions. For example, you can get very high resolution with a micro, micrometer resolution at a millimeter depths, or you can get hundreds of micrometer resolutions at a centimeter depths. No matter how, what you do, they all enjoy the same type of optical contrast, just at a different lens scale and the different system configuration. So it's quite flexible for people who are doing um, you know, fundamental research or clinical study. So you can configure the photoacoustic imaging system accordingly based on the resolution and the imaging depths needed for that study. So what we can image? Uh, because we're relying on the optical absorption, we do not rely on the fluorescent emission. So as long as the molecules are absorbing light at any wavelengths, we can use that molecule as a <laughs> excuse me, potential photoacoustic imaging contrast. So endogenously speaking, we have <laughs> so many molecules inside the tissue uh, that are absorbing light endogenously. Uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, hemoglobin in the rabbit cells so abundant can use that to image in the <clears throat> blood vessels. We can also use the melanin, for example, to image in the melanoma in the skin. <clears throat> and there are also other endogenous molecules, for example, in the UV range, you can <clears throat> image DNA and uh, RNA, <clears throat> excuse me, or you can, <clears throat> you, <clears throat> you can image <clears throat> water or glucose in the near infrared wavelength range. But along all the wavelengths range, we love the near infrared wavelengths the most because of the light can go to the tissue the best, right? The penetration depths to the best for near infrared window. And you know, this is the Duke uh, Chapel. You know, we enjoy the chapel and also the blue sky uh, a lot every day. Um, but the blue light doesn't really go through the tissue very well, as you can see. And the green light is uh, a bit better, but still not very good. Uh, the red light is the best in terms of tissue penetration. So that is why, you know, the, the light is, uh, <clears throat> uh, the wavelength is very important for us. And it, it not just, does not just uh, determine the contrast of what we're looking at, but also determines eventually the penetration depths of the imaging 
uh, system. And in addition to the endogenous contrast, uh, there are a lot of exogenous contrasts that we can potentially use. Uh, very similar to fluorescent imaging, you can, you can find all kinds of organic dyes or nanoparticles or even uh, genetically uh, encoded uh, products like proteins. Uh, those uh, in exogenous contrasts that can be uh, precisely uh, delivered or expressed inside the tissues, inside the organs. And that can be used as photocosmetic contrast as well, since they are absorbing light. Um, sometimes they, they, they have fluorescent signals, sometimes they do not. And we do not really uh, care because as long as the absorption happens, uh, the rest of the process is for uh, the uh, photoacoustic effect. So this really put, uh, put photocosmetic into a better position because we can be more flexible in terms of contrast choice, right? Uh, only a small portion of molecules are fluorescent. Uh, most of most of the uh, molecules are not, so that can uh, potentially wet, uh, widen the photocosmogen uh, in terms of its contrast uh, flexibility. And I'll give you two examples about photocosmogen using the hemoglobin as a contrast for imaging blood vessels. As I promised, uh, we can tune the optic uh, op optic wavelengths. We can configure the uh, light and sound in order to achieve different penetration depths or different uh, resolution. So this is a, a we call a microscopy uh, version of photocosmogen that really focuses on the microvasculature of the tissue um, with you know with high contrast, high resolution, and um, you know as you can see that the this is a mouse mouse skin. Uh, the vessels can be imaged almost without uh, uh, any background because the, uh, the robot cells in the in the blood vessels are strongly absorbing the light while the background tissue, collagen, water, and they do not absorb light at this wavelength. They are silent, they're dark. Uh, so the, the resolution is determined in this case by optical focusing. So you can get down to single vessel level of details. And you may also notice that there is another uh, black spot, which is a melanoma implanted the tumor. Uh, this wavelength, both melanin and hemoglobin absorbs strongly. So you can see both the blood vessels and the uh, melanoma. Well, we can play with the optical wavelengths. So we can choose a different wavelength, which does not um, have a lot of hemoglobin signature, but the melanin still absorbs strongly. In this case, you only see the melanoma without seeing the, the blood vessels anymore. So this is a simple example of the photocustom spectroscopy. So you can tune the optical wavelengths and selectively image any molecules you like by that, uh, as that specific wavelength. Where you can do multiple wavelengths and you can quantify each of the components individually. And I promise that you can also tune the optical um, or uh, ultrasound system to get deeper penetration. Uh, in this case, we are doing low ultrasound frequency and we do a diffuse light excitation, then you can get centimeters of penetration. In this case, you can see the whole animal's cross section with uh, major organs clearly imaged with hemoglobin as a contrast again. It is, you know, this is the same contrast mechanism as the last, the previous high resolution imaging, but in this case, the, just the penetration depths and the resolutions are different. And so this really gives us this, you know, um, the flexibility in terms of where you want to look at, how fine you want to uh, look at your target and what's the penetration depths you want to look at. So I, um, this is probably, this is the, one of the uh, most uh, attractive features of photocosmogen and it can be broadly applicable for uh, different applications. So with that said, with that uh, 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 information, hopefully we'll get a, a basic uh, understanding about photocosmogen. And in my lab at Duke, we, uh, we have uh, uh, a few imaging uh, or few directions we're pushing. Um, all of them are trying to improve the photocosmogen at a different aspect. Uh, for example, we have uh, technologies which are focused on uh, improving the imaging speed right, to have high to achieve high throughput uh, applications, or we can push the penetration depths in order to get close to clinical need, and or we can improve the sensitivity of photocosmogen to look at different molecular probes and to look at different uh, biofunctions. So all of them are centered around the goal to make the photocosmogen better and more more colorful and deeper and uh, faster. So because of the time, I will probably just talk about the speed and also the sensitivity aspect. And if you're interested, we can talk about the, uh, the imaging depths uh, at, uh, at the discussion session. 
So the first technology we're developing, or the group of technology we're developing in my lab, is trying to break the limit of the speed, not for your traffic ticket purpose, but also but for to um, to but for the acceleration and imaging speed to have a, a dynamic uh, function. And uh, in most cases, you know, for people who are who are working on uh, imaging technologies, you probably have to uh, struggle between uh, you know a few imaging parameters in order to uh, you know improve one parameter, but you have to sacrifice another one. Right? And this is very common for imaging people. And we are facing the same problem for photoacoustimaging. Sometimes we have to sacrifice the field of view or resolution in order to get the image speed high um, elevated uh, speed up. So um, we are trying to break that uh, um, dynamo. We're trying to, trying to develop technologies over the years that um, that can keep the resolution, keep the field of view well accelerating the speed. The one effort is to use the, we call that a polygon scanning based photocrystal microscopy. Um, we'll skip the details, but the, the end result is we have, uh, you know, accelerated image speed of photocrystal microscopy by more than a thousand times. Well, without sacrificing the speed or field of view, um, sacrificing the resolution or field of view or the sensitivity, which is very important for us to, do, to look at the small uh, signals or small features. And uh, this is a video showing the key component of the system, which is the polygon scanner, and it's rotating so fast, you probably won't be able to see this, the rotation at all. But if you look at where the animal is sitting, you can see the light is actually scanned on top of the animal's head. I'll give you a few examples about this system, what we can do, right? The system is as good as its applications. If you can uh, enable new discovery or new technology or new science, that is the best reward for us who develop the technologies. Uh, so we are looking at one very important drug used in hospitals almost every day is epilephrine. Epilephrine is widely used for people who are uh, developing, uh, who are uh, who have uh, cardiac arrest, for example, in the hospital or in, uh, in the emergency room. And epilephrine's role is to constrict the vessels and elevate the blood pressure to keep the vital organs in the body alive while um, basically uh, redistribute the blood to <clears throat> from other uh, other organs and uh, for a long time people are um, struggling about the fact that uh, in, in a lot of cases when the patients are treated with epilephrine especially with multi-dose of epilephrine in the ER the heart can be saved. The patient come back with heart beating. However, the brain never come back or the patient never wake up or the patient wake up with a significant loss of the brain functions. So the question is what really, what really happens with this drug when uh, it's used for patients and especially what happens to the brain. In a you know, long time, for a long time, you know, people are not so concerned about this drug because brain is so well protected with, you know, we think it's, so well regulated, the drug should not do anything to the brain. However, that's uh, challenge, that conclusion or that belief was challenged by our results with this high speed for the cosmic microscopy. I'm going to show you a video. Uh, this is a video has two uh, segments. You see on the left, that's the mouse brain vasculature. And we have this um, <clears throat> whole brain vasculature imaging. And on the right side is oxygenation of we can do multivalence excitation. We can quantify how much oxygen is in the blood without doing any contrast agent injection. So this is all, all based on endogenous contrast. And the speed is so fast, we are able to capture dynamics. Because the drug really uh, acts fast, so it's a very fast process. Let me see what happens. So to play the video, you can see at the very beginning we inject the drug. You can see the the brain becomes quickly becomes very hypoxic after a drug is, uh, is, is injected. And this is only a single dose injection. Imagine what happened to multi-dose injection. So the, 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 it's very shocking to us because it seems that epilephrine does constrict blood vessels, especially the micro vessels in the brain, and which introduce a significant hypoxic condition into the brain for actually more than 10 minutes, which is very, very dramatic for the brain. The brain doesn't have any, doesn't have any oxygen reserve. So if you are in the oxygen deprived condition for uh, for 10 minutes, that is bad news for the brain. And there's no wonder you will have uh, function loss in the brain due to the lack of oxygen. Uh, 
So basically, this is a, a very um, surprising for us. And uh, the work is published this year, and it actually introduced it, it generates a lot of interest from the clinical side, and potentially they can change people's opinion or people's practice how they want to use epinephrine in the brain, and how does that change the patient outcome down the road. The second example of this high-speed photocosmetry is we try to mitigate the uh, motion artifacts. You know, for us who do imaging technology, you, you want enemy for us to overcome is always the motion. So if your image speed is slower than the motion of the target itself, then your image quality cannot be good due to the motion artifacts or distortion of the motion. And that has been a problem for us, for example, to study um, organs which are always moving or is very sensitive to motion. For example, placenta is one of the organs that we are interested with. Placenta, you know, is vital for pregnancy. It delivers nutrients and oxygen and also carry out the waste from the fetus. However, placenta is engineering a challenge to, to study because placenta is always <clears throat> very very sensitive to motion. It's so close to the belly, the animal is always <clears throat> breathing, so that changes the, the position of the placenta, and that gives us the trouble for acquiring a high-quality image. So we uh, use this high-speed photo microscopy, and we study the placenta development. Now it's because the speed is so fast, the field view is so large, and the resolution is still very good, then we can look at uh, the single placenta or multiple placentas uh, development over time actually over entire pregnancy, if you want. So we can see how the placenta develops these micro vessels over time, and how does the oxygenation change over time. We're at different phase of the uh, pregnancy that gives a lot of information which is not available before. And that's a healthy pregnancy, but what happens to uh, not so healthy pregnancy? So this gives us a, a chance to study alcohol consumption, which is you know, a big issue in the States for, uh, uh, for pregnancy. So what really happens to the uh, placenta when people drink, uh, especially for, you know, people say casual drink, like a little bit of alcohol, you know, maybe once up for a while. So we'll see what happens. Um, again, this is a video showing what happens to the placenta in real time when the animal is uh, challenged with a dose of alcohol. Um, and on the left still, that's the microvasculature of the placenta. On the right, that's oxygenation. So we just pay attention to the color of the placenta, especially look at the background, sort of the background, which is blue color. The placenta is known to have low oxygenation uh, condition. So they prefer this kind of hypoxic condition in order to trigger the angiogenesis. So that is why most of the vessels are blue if you look at that. And let's see what happens when we give the animal a dose of alcohol. And uh, so this is the video showing uh, a baseline, then we inject the alcohol, you can see the background. The vessels become redder. So that indicates there is a elevated blood perfusion and also increased oxygenation level in the placenta. More oxygen is delivered to the placenta, as you can imagine, more oxygen will be delivered to the fetus, which may not be the, the ideal scenario for pregnancy or for a fetus because more oxygen means more stress and which is not a good sign. And this really shows what happens to the, um, to the placenta hemodynamics when the alcohol is consumed. And imagine there's just the one dose of alcohol. Imagine what happens if we are, we are like, continuous drinking, we drink a lot day by day, and this will be, this will be a challenge for the placenta development. So this is the second example that we can apply this high-speed imaging and for a very meaningful uh, preclinical study that potentially has impact on the, um, on the clinical management of the pregnancy. The third example is what we recently published on uh, Science actually last year, almost a year ago, is uh, to study a very magic uh, animal model. Uh, this animal is not, some, it's not something you can find in your backyard. It's from uh, South America actually in the Amazon jungles. And this, is, uh, this animal is called glass frog. Uh, glass frog has a name because it can become transparent when they are sleeping. When they are uh, active, when they're active, they look at just normal, but when they are sleeping, they almost become transparent without too much features, especially underneath a piece of leaf. If I do not tell you there are four frogs on this leaf, you probably won't be able to tell. 
So what really happens to the frog? Um, what happens to its um, transparency when it's sleeping? Currently, that's not something we can do daily, but frogs, gauze frogs do this every day for 10 hours. And this work has been, uh, we study this frog for uh, quite a few years and we figure out the reason and also the, um, the, uh, the secret behind that. And if you look at the frog when it's sleeping and when it's active, the difference is the color. You know, if, when it's active, it's a little bit redder than when it's sleeping. So look at the photo of the frogs when it's sleeping and active. You can see that um, most of the vessels are, are grown, not, not visible. So what really happens is the frog does a very interesting trick. The frog concentrates 90% of its ribosomes cells into the liver when, they are, when it's sleeping. And that can be repeated every day for 10 hours. And really it's fascinating because they, they try to reduce the amount of red blood cells in the circulation system in order to become more transparent because red blood cells or hemoglobin absorb so much light, it casts a shadow on the leaf. But if they remove the red blood cells from the circulation system, they can become automatically three to five times more transparent as what you see from the pictures. Okay? So if you look at the video of a quarry bed high speed image, you will see what happens when they're falling asleep. So this is really the only animal we know that they will become transparent when they're sleeping by removing the rib cells from its circulation system. Okay, so that's what we have. And you can see all the blood vessels disappear. And that's because the rib cells are extracted from the circulation system. So it's really a lot of uh, interest from the, from the public about this, this uh, animal model. This actually the uh, so we have a lot of follow-up study ongoing and try to answer more questions about this frog with photocosmetics. Okay. I have roughly five minutes left. So I'll just wrap up very quickly about the second work we're working on, and <clears throat> which is trying to uh, make photocosmetics better in terms of uh, molecular sensitivity. Um, so I'm gonna skip uh, the my background, but the, 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 the benefit or motivation is we try to um, improve the photocosmetics for detecting the, the very weak uh, molecular probes in the context or in the background of the blood signal. Blood is everywhere, and we have to overcome the, the, the strong background from the blood signal where we look at something that's weaker, like molecular probes. So we turn our eyes to a, a, a family of uh, um, proteins called uh, photoswitchable fetochromes. And this protein can be switched on and off by light and near infrared light. And they become different colors when you shine light on the protein, and that can be repeated. So this kind of color change is perfect for photocosmetics because we are so sensitive to color difference, and that gives us a chance to modulate the protein's optical absorption and give us the photo switching signal that can be detected and extracted from the background signal. And that gives us much better sensitivity. So we actually have developed animal models to give us a much more flexible control of where the proteins are expressed and how they are expressed and what kind of uh, cell types or tissue types we're targeting by developing the animals. So we really have a photo switching or color changing mouse and that can be used for a lot of studies. So one example is to look at the liver, right? You can look at how the liver uh, regenerate uh, when we cut one third of the liver lobe out, then you see what happens to the liver and when they regenerate within uh, two weeks. It's fascinating. And we can see not just blood vessels come back, but we can also use a photo switching signal to look at how the liver cells regenerate. And we can also look at the neurons. You know, for example, this is, a, this is a, we specifically target the neurons in the brain and we make neuron blinking. So by photo switching the neurons, we can make them blinking, while the background signal from the blood does not blink. So that gives us a much better way, much better uh, sensitivity um, um, for for this uh, neural image. Okay. So uh, this is the second work, and uh, actually, uh, if I have a, I have a few minutes left, so for the last technology we're developing and what we're introducing today is actually a work just published today and came online yesterday, but it was printed today. Uh, it's a collaboration with uh, Shrek Zhang at Harvard. And we are trying to overcome another limit in uh, biomedical research. You know, bioprinting has been widely uh, <clears throat> available by using light to cure the uh, you know photosensitive ink, right? So there has been many, many work on that. But just like optical imaging, 
the bell printing using light has a fundamental limit that is the penetration depth because it cannot go very deep, which is the same reason for optical microscope. And we're thinking, can we actually harvest, you know, use sound waves to do bell printing? Because sound waves can be much better uh, in penetration. And can we harvest that power to do bell printing? So the answer is what we have done in the last three years. So we're trying to develop a family of ink. It's called sono inks. You can imagine this like a, a ink that's a sensitive to sound pressure and sound waves that can be exposed to sound waves and can be cured. So this is what we actually do. We have developed a, 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 you know, var a variation of uh, sound inks that can be sound sensitive and that can be exposed that can be exposed to sound waves to to um, uh, to translate from a liquid state to a solid state, which is printing process. And we're going to skip the details, but what eventually we do is we can do uh, uh, ultrasound printing of the sound inks through centimeters of tissues while the, um, the, the tissues are spared from any, uh, from any uh, damage. So this is one example we can do um, of this uh, vascular printing inside a, just a tank just to show the, the process of the printing. Uh, you can see the, the ink itself is, is very red, right, which is not a doable by optical printing because the red color is not preferred. But for sound printing, ultrasound printing, it's not a problem. We don't care about the colors. You can see that, that this ink can be converted from uh, sol uh, liquid to solid state by uh, focusing ultrasound into the ink and changing the phase from liquid to solid. Okay. So the, the potential application is to print, uh, for example, bone structures through tissues or even mend um, the heart um, you know, in, through the chest and the heart wall. So this is another example we're doing here is uh, to uh, fix the hole inside the heart. And you can see the ink has you know, atrial appendix that is uh, basically a hole inside the heart. And we can use the ink, uh, sauna ink, to fill that hole and uh, by um, moving over ultrasound uh, pressure, or moving ultrasound printing probe around, and we can fill the hole in three-dimensional space, which actually, uh, you know, conforms to the to the stru heart structure very well, well with the printed structure attached to the tissue um, tightly. So this is an, an, another benefit of doing sound, right? Not just for imaging purpose in photocoose imaging, but also by harvest the sound penetration and together with the novel sound ink that we can just potentially achieve a treatment that's deeper than traditional uh, bioprinting technologies. So to summarize, uh, we are uh, developing technologies which um, you know which is focused on photocosmogen and to trying to push the penetration depths, the uh, speed and the sensitivity in order to enable uh, discovery or applications which are not available by other imaging modalities or other traditional photocosmetic modalities. And we're also trying to harvest the sound waves for treatment purpose, for example, in bio printing. And hopefully we'll be able to um, translate some of those technologies in the lab to either preclinical um, discovery uh, or applications or even clinical uh, human health care. All right, thank you very much for your time and I look forward to the discussion at the later point. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Yao, for the wonderful work. Uh, um, okay, so there is a quick note that we have roughly 9,000 audience online. So for this talk, so it's really popular and they're very welcomed. Okay, great. So uh, we have about 30 minutes for discussion. Okay, um, I'll, I'll kick off the, the first one to Professor Yao. So the thing is that when you work with your uh, photoacoustic, I remember you said you can go deep into one centimeter. So That's right. is it possible? Is it possible that you can go deeper so that we can get the tumor, you know, the vessels in the tumor? Let's um, let's say in deep in the body, like, uh, like in the liver tumor. Okay, so it's really deep. So is there any way that you can you can see how you know the tumor grows? Right, so that's a very good question. That's the uh, penetration limit for photocosmogen. Um, as I mentioned briefly, the penetration of the photocosmogen is determined jointly by light and sound. So mm -hmm. you have to deliver photons into the deeper region of the tissue or the body, and you have to get the ultrasound out of that, which is less a problem. 
because ultrasound really can go deep and you don't have any problem for image intensity imager, for example, in the hospitals, look at the babies, right? And so ultrasound is a lesser concern. What is more um, challenging is the light delivery. How much, how much, what's the maximum penetration we can achieve is usually determined by how much light we can deliver. The good news about photocruise imaging is we do not want, we do not have to focus the photons. The photons can be diffused as much as photons want. As long as the photons can achieve or can reach to the target, their job is finished. So that's why um, centimeters of penetration can be achieved uh, pretty easily by photocruise imaging. And I think in the, in, in the photocruise imaging field, um, uh, up to seven or even 10 centimeter penetration has been demonstrated by configuring the sound and light uh, together, especially by using the near infrared light excitation and by using low frequency ultrasound detection, and also by using all kinds of um, technology innovations to improve the sensitivity. So uh, eventually, to back to your question, eventually the penetration depth is determined by how deep we can deliver the light. And yes. if you can deliver that to a few centimeters, then the penetration depth is a few centimeters. Okay. Yeah, great. So we're looking for, you know, it's powerful really into the tumor regions. And uh, um, yeah. <laughs> um, can I have also uh, have, have a question to Matthew? Yeah. It's um, when, when you build your 3D um, scaffold and you can use different materials like papers or like the, the PETG silicon stuff. So, mm -hmm. and, and you know, that the cells can grow layer by layer and still communicate with each other. Um, but for especially, let's say, because I work on drug screening, all right? So we also um, need to consider about how drugs can go, you know, uh, working interact with with the cells and um, uh, okay, and interact with the cells and and see how it works um, to kill the cancer cells, etc. So, um, but however, in human bodies, actually, it's not only the drug. There will be other components in the blood, like you know, different hormone levels and different other enzyme levels in the blood. It, is it possible that we can also, you know, integrate those, all those factors in the um, on chip ones, like your scaffold setup? Oh, model? yeah. <clears throat> yeah, totally. Yeah, I agree with you. There's actually, you know, there's a couple of things that you think about with drug screening. You know, a lot of times drugs are given as pro-drugs, right? Which also have to be converted somewhere. Maybe the liver yeah. converts them beforehand. Um, and so you do have to think about flow and introduction. All the stuff I showed was was static, right? So we can assemble our things, put them in a well plate and kind of walk away. Uh, we also have devices which are pretty simple um, where you can just basically have media constantly flowing over the culture. And so there's that exchange at the top uh, or you can engineer it so it exchanges at the top and the bottom, but we can introduce those factors. Um, one of the things we look at a lot in my lab is like what modulates estrogen signaling um, as cancer mm -hmm. progresses, right? And adipocytes or fat cells are one of the major players in terms of modulating estrogen sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, and those and fibroblasts have been kind of implicated in basically resistance to sort of certain like, um, you know, like selective estrogen modulator drugs like tamoxifen. And so our system allows for you to either have those cells in contact or have them not in contact, but in, allow them to talk to one another. And so you can flow basically any sort of media you want over top of them. Um, and still it's, we basically built some things that it just plugs into a regular like six well plate and it's pretty simple to do. So yeah, you can, you can make it so we could, we can daisy chain lots of different tissues together. We can have mm -hmm. individual like tumors and we flow different things in them, but yeah, you can totally do all those things actually pretty simply and pretty cheaply. Yeah. And pretty powerful. Yeah, great work. <laughs> it's that, that's really intriguing. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. And Professor yeah. Zhang, yeah. Yeah, I, I have a following question for Marshall. Yeah, uh, I I think I like the layer cake idea, you know. Yeah, it looks beautiful also, you know, uh, as kind of a, you know, layer by layer, so, you know, you can add in all of this. So you use paper-based, you know, fabrication. So I have a question is how about, uh, you know, different layers? Did you need to, you know, how to kind of, you know, uh, assembling all this and then you need normally you know like in the silicon so we have some align marker or something for this you know papers several layers how you mark that <laughs> yeah we um we definitely aren't very fancy i can tell you that um we basically when we go to assemble the tissues or we go to stack the things on top of each other we end up having on the ends we poke little holes in them and so basically we can have, it looks like a little skewer then. And so you put the first layer down on the two skewers and then you put the next one and the third one. And so as you stack them, they all self align. And so then once they're stacked and aligned, you can pick them up and move them wherever you want. Some, I have to do that because I like drink too much coffee and my hands shake a lot. Some of my students are so good. Like they can just assemble them you know, with their, with nothing, they can just do it by stacking them on top of each other and they can get them aligned really well. Um, and okay. most of the- that, That's we, nice, that's manually, you know, that's yeah. <laughs> not automatically. Okay, so I have another question, I like use, you know, paper-based chips, as you know, for the cell culture. Normally this will be uh, a little bit longer time, you know, and at least hours or something. So how about the paper? Can it, you know, stable? You know, oh yeah. So time? we've we've cultured cells and paper scaffolds for about thirty days. Um. So the the paper itself is actually pretty stable to media. It's pretty stable to salt. Um. Some early work we've done too is we've taken the tumor stacks, and we with collaborators in the medical school, we've actually kind of implanted them into the fat pads of mice also to see like, could we use the scaffolds basically as a way to put in cells and then easily retrieve them. And within, you know, a, we did a two, we, we inserted the stack inside a mouse um, and we pulled it back out two weeks later and we were still able to separate them all and the scaffolds were all still there. Um, wow. You know, the nice thing about working in with mammals is that we don't normally, we do not make cellulases, right? So we're not good at breaking down cellulose. And so it's a good material in terms of um, stability over time because there just are no natural enzymes basically to break it down. Okay, great to know that. Yeah, so uh, Junjie, yeah, a oh, wonderful talk. And uh, I yes. think I'm so exciting to hear you talk, you know, uh, so many things. Especially for the grass, you know, glass bread, you know, yeah, so so fun and so interesting. I mean, you mentioned that they remove that red blood cell, you know, when when the light goes dark, right? Yeah, if you turn off the light, they remove that, or they have a switch, they turn on or turn off something, yeah. Are you talking about the frog work, or we're talking yeah, about yeah. the photo switch and? Um, no, 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 the, the, the frog. Yeah. The frog, okay. Um, actually, they sleep at daytime. Uh, they do not sleep at night like we do. Uh, that's the reason why they want to be transparent, since the daytime is kind of hard for them to stay safe. But they have to sleep at daytime in the jungle. Um, they they have to, you know, they wake up at night, they, uh, they feed, they uh, play with friends, and they, uh, you know, they find... Um, <clears throat> Other they fun fly? at night. They at also night. fly. <laughs> uh, they don't fly, uh, but they have to stay transparent in the daytime. That's why they develop this trick to become transparent. Um, otherwise, it's easy for them to be spotted or do you know uh, by other predators. Um, so the 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 trick they play is they actually can can reduce their metabolism so much when they're sleeping. Uh, so they do not need almost do not need any oxygen. They just keep ten percent of the red blood cells in the in the in the work. They remove ninety percent of red blood cells to the liver. So you can imagine that's very hypoxic or 
um, it's, it's very low oxygen level for the frog to stay fairly alive. But they managed to do that every day, 10 hours a day. And so that's very interesting. Uh, we're trying to figure out what really happens to the metabolism of the frog. How do they stay alive with just 10% of oxygen? And another interesting aspect of this study is, um, is the blood clotting. You know, we <clears throat> as mammals, like Matt mentioned, we actually, uh, we are not really good at keeping more um, concentrating the blood. Once you have a <clears throat> blood concentration or concentrated blood anywhere, it normally forms a clot very quickly. So that blocks the vessels, <clears throat> for example, in the, in the stroke case. But frogs, uh, this gauze frog is very good at that. They can concentrate 90% of the red blood cells <clears throat> in the liver small organ, and they can still keep the red blood cells <clears throat> functional without any clotting. There must be something in the blood or in their liver that can keep the red blood cells from clotting. Well, when they need the red blood cells, when they wake up, they still can just release the red blood cells almost immediately into the bloodstream and become functional. So that's something we're also working on, trying to find out what is really the small factor, what chemical signals they're working on, what they have that can stop the blood from clotting, which is potentially useful because you know <clears throat> there's so many, so many problems with us when you know when the blood is clotted, like stroke, uh, thrombosis. Uh, those are just a big problem for the for people who are <clears throat> you know who have the uh, clotting issues. If we can find out how the frog does the trick, that might be able to help us to treat the patients. Yes, that's, that's really, really interesting and important. Uh, go ahead, you know, for more details and find that trick. Yeah, also uh, for, you know, less than 10, you know, percent of the oxygen. That, that's amazing too. No, normally if you go to, you know, uh, like a tea belt, yeah. So just the oxygen may be reduced about one or two percent. So mm -hmm. everyone feeling so bad, you know, you slow down and you couldn't move. But how this frog was still, you know, alive? <laughs> That's a good question. And I don't have the answer yet. But clearly they can live happily with that. And um, <laughs> so there must be something they have, which we do not enjoy. Okay, I have another question for you. As mm -hmm. you now, you know, you do a lot of work, faster, deeper, qualify, you know, all this. I think half of them are hardware, you know, half of them are software, right? Mm. Yeah. So Roughly. you do a yes. lot of uh, computing too. So how did you, you know, manage this? Um, I, as you know, I surely I'm just sitting in my office. I do not do much of this. Uh, it's my people. And as most importantly, um, working in the lab, working uh, working in science, I think it's work with the right people, uh, not just your collaborators, but also your students, your postdocs, your lab stuff. Uh, so by finding the right people who are much better than me in both hardware and the software, uh, I can I can achieve you know all those um, um, wonderful work we have been working on. And so what I'm doing is I'm trying to identify the talents who can help me uh, to to build the to build the technologies we're interested with. I have a sense of what I need, what we need, what is the bottleneck of the technology. Then my job is to find the people who can help us to build it. And same for the collaborators, um, uh, same for the students. And uh, some students they come in, they do not really have the background, but you know. They're so smart, they can learn anything. <laughs> and so back to your question, uh, how do I manage that? Um, I do not manage my personal skills. I cannot, I'm too old for that to learn anything that's too new. But I have a lot of talented people around me that help me to build that. Okay, super nice. Yeah, this also connects to my last question for both of you and Matthew. I know both of you are young professors, like, you know, Behaven was left for his young two years old doctors must deliver to, you know, the daycare. So I think, you know, the life was uh, uh, during this time period as should be, you know, 
very tough. You need to negotiate with students. You need to, get, you know, for more time for the families. So yeah, uh, how to manage this time? You know, yeah, your time, your time. <laughs> Matt, do you want to go ahead? I I can I can follow up. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think. You know, I think the hard thing is, is that most people who do research do it because they love science, um, you know, and they want to learn new things and they're really excited. And it's really easy to let that plus all the other things you need to do as you're running a lab kind of overtake your life. Um, and, you know, I'm a huge proponent that everyone should take time during the day, during the week to make sure that they do the things that center them and make them happy and healthy. And I think with, you know, as you're starting out a lab or just doing research in general, the reality is your to-do list will always have 100 items on them. And you'll be lucky if you get one of them done a day. <laughs> and like accepting that tomorrow, those 99 other things will still be there. And it's okay if they didn't all get done in one day, I think is really important, right? The setting the limits for yourself to say, I'm going to go and do other stuff. I'm going to make sure that I take care of the people who need me and that I need. I think that's the most important. And I think that actually, you know, for all the talks today, everything we saw was like crazy creative. And I think the only way you can be crazy creative is if you go home and do other fun things and just let your brain kind of like chill out for a while. So I think that's kind of like important. Did you please? Yeah, I, I can, I can, Jimmy, I agree with uh, Matt. Uh, um, you know, the, I think the, the, the fundamental power of energy or the driving force behind all this exciting sense is the love of science. You know, we love what we do. And we're lucky that we do what we love. So it's kind of rare for uh, most careers. And that's the fundamental driving force for me, at least uh, to wake up every morning to, you know, to go to bed really late. As a, life is really busy as, as, a, as a young prof professor. Uh, however, you know, since you are always actively thinking, you always have something in your mind to think about. So I think the efficiency of the time uh, is actually pretty high. So like Matt said, you have 100, 100 things on your to-do list. So it's like you never let a second sleep that does not have something you're thinking of. So the efficiency of the time is actually high. And the second thing I'm thinking is we actually work with people who are a lot of times smarter than us and they know more than us in, in many cases. So we kind of spread out. We work with people you don't have to worry about other people's, uh, the, you know, their their problems. So uh, they take care of the aspects of the research. Some, you know, other aspects of research. You focus on what you're good at, and by combining the bringing the minds together, I think it's surely a one plus one larger than two scenario in many cases. And that actually, you can think of that as an amplification of your time. You're not really using just your time. You're using other people's time as well. So by putting, bringing the minds together, we are enjoying more than 24 hours a day. That's the case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how nice it is. I remember that uh, you no know, long time ago, uh, I can ask, uh, discuss with Paul Weiss, you know, Paul was in uh, LA. So as always, four o'clock in the morning, wake up. So I asked Paul, what's the kind of, uh, for a long time, you so dedicated to all this. So, yeah. Paul say that, you know, almost the same words. I love it. Yeah. Every morning, this was, I love, you know, I wake up, met so many talent, you know, got, got my brain was storming there. So that's exactly, you know, to be a scientist, exciting. Yeah. So that's right. Going, totally. oh my, yeah. My question over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? No. Yeah. For so, me, um, <laughs> Okay, so I apologize. Actually, my news was old. The online audience is 15,000, not 9,000. Okay, yeah, <laughs> so that's great. Um, okay, so thanks everybody. And um, let me broadcast um, 
uh, the next meeting. Okay, uh, well, one second. Yeah. So the the next uh, uh, the, the the meeting on uh, the seminar. Okay, the seminar on next Friday is actually the ITAX 2023 ceremony with um, quite a few um, big figures giving talks. So um, everybody is welcome and uh, we are looking forward to it. Okay, uh, so okay. again, ITAX talks to connect the world and universe. So thanks everybody, the, the speakers and all the Zikurchan 努力才是真的方向 